Well, it's, um, it's a real privilege for me to be here with you, and uh, I'm going to be with you uh, for a whole week, as it turns out. I'll start with an apology. I've only missed, had two cancelled flights in 16 years of international uh, travel, uh, where I tend to go to maybe 20, 25 different countries a year. A few years ago, it was when a volcano blew up in Iceland, and uh, I got stuck at home, and uh, a whole string of meetings were cancelled. And um, the other one was yesterday, uh, in England, when we had one and a half inches of snow, and therefore the airport shut down. <laughs> and so, um, uh, but I'm with you now. Uh, the body is here. My mind is probably somewhere over the mid-Atlantic. Uh, if it feels like you need simultaneous translation into English, then I'll see if I can arrange that for tomorrow. Um, hopefully, I'll be a bit more awake then. But it is good to be with you. If I, let me just take just a couple of minutes just to try to explain what I'm going to be doing this week. Um, because I've now extended the trip slightly, so you'll also sadly get to hear me on Friday as well. Um, that probably means that God is punishing you with my presence uh, to lead you to a point of deep repentance before Him. Um, and what I'm going to try and do with the titles that have been assigned me um, uh, is in each one to try to look at it in a slightly critical context. Now, for this evening, the context that I will be uh, taking will be want to do with certain moral challenges that come to us personally. Now, tomorrow, what I'd like to do is deal with some of the moral objections about the nature of God's existence and some of the moral objections about the church as we look at what does it truly mean to be called by Christ. Now, the day after that, when we're looking about loving God with our hearts and minds, what I'd like to try to do within the context of that particular talk is also deal with some of the issues that science have thrown up in relationship to the Christian faith and ask, are these two things somehow either mutually incompatible, can they actually not work together? Now, on Wednesday night, it's a time of just general Q&A. And here's what we're trying to work on at the moment. There may be a technical solution to this, but on Friday morning, when I come back to speak to you for the last time, in my ideal world, this is what would happen. Someone in this audience who is a, actually knows how to use a computer would generate a website that would allow people or a blog to post the most difficult question you can think of in relationship to the Christian faith. And then ideally on Thursday, people could look through that list of questions, whether it was 10 or 100 long, and then vote three times for the three questions they think are the hardest that a Christian could try to respond to to actually deal with. What are the three biggest questions, the three biggest objections, the three hardest issues to speak to? And then I'll roll up on Friday without any notes whatsoever, and whatever the top three questions are, I'll try and preach and speak to those. Um, now, if that, we can't do that technologically, then what we're going to do is I'm going to try and get a flip chart and have it present at every meeting, starting as of tomorrow, and, during, and after each meeting, before each meeting, you can just come up, write up your questions with a marker pen on that flip chart, and we'll keep going until we fill the whole thing, if need be, and then on Thursday, somehow make it available for people to come and vote using a Roman numeral system, and then we'll just tot up the ones and see who wins on Friday morning, and whatever is the number one, then that will be my title, and I'll try and speak to that. So we got, that's what we're going to try. That's what I'm going to try and do. That's what I'm aiming for while I'm with you. And now whether I hit it, I'm going to have to leave it up for you to decide. Now, the title I was given for this evening was, the issue, was Obstacles to the Spiritual Life. Now, I am not going to give an overview talk on this subject. There are many obstacles that may well affect your spiritual life. And they can be anything from laziness to intellectual struggle to all kinds of issues. But what I'd like to try to do is I'd like to try to focus it in a particular way, and hopefully you'll see, see why. Now, you've heard um, from the brief introduction about me that I was not raised either in a Christian country or in a Christian family. And so um, I was actually raised up in a, in a culture that certainly made me either very disinterested in God or very antithetical to God. Um, certainly um, in Saudi Arabia, where I spent most of my childhood, if you organized a meeting like this in Saudi Arabia, that would be a crime punishable by death. Okay, they would remove your head using an axe. This is a very effective deterrent. There are no repeat offenders. I grew up hearing nothing about the gospel. Now, when my, at the age of 16, my parents moved to a country in the Mediterranean called Cyprus. And at that point, I can remember moving to Cyprus as a teenager, and at that point, really, my entire worldview, the entire goal of my life was summed up in one simple word, and that word was cool. Now, I'm now sufficiently culturally out of date not even to know whether it's cool to be cool anymore, but when I was 16, coolness was the epitome, the thing that everybody was striving for and wanted to achieve. And so I built an image for myself, which I then lived out in my life in order to achieve the goal which I had set before me. 
Now, there were many heroes. I've watched many, many films growing up, probably far too many than is actually good for me. And I began my quest to be cool by essentially copying what I'd seen on the screen. Now, one of my heroes was a man, um, an actor, uh, amazingly never has been given an Oscar, despite his incredible body of work, very well known, maybe one of the finest actors ever to pass through Hollywood, a man by the name of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And I had <laughs> carefully made a detailed study of everything that he had done, and I can uh, remember one of his films started with him walking up a mountain while carrying a large tree on his shoulder, and uh, while smoking a large cigar. Now, since I didn't have the build or the inclination to carry cigars, the only part of the image which I could appropriate to myself was that of cigar smoking. So I used to smoke Cuban cigars. They looked like little baseball bats. I thought that made me look very cool. Another one of my heroes was a man by the name of James Bond. And I obviously wanted to be like James Bond. If you read the novels as opposed to the films, then you'll be aware of the fact that in the novels, James Bond has a silver cigarette case. So I went out and bought myself a silver cigarette case. Another one of my heroes, who for me really was the epitome of coolness, there was no one cooler than him, was a man by the name of Clint Eastwood. Again, you may be familiar with some of his work. Now, I wanted to be like him. Now, what I'm telling you is completely true. Um, I can uh, remember at this age, when I used to go out at nights, I used to have my silver cigarette case, which I'd keep in my pocket, and I also used to take, you know that bit on a box of matches, you strike the match against to light it? Well, I used to remove that and stick it to the bottom of my shoe. So I could open up my cigarette case, remove a filterless cigarette, flick it in the air, catch it, doesn't matter what end you catch, you could then take a match and light it. Okay? That whole thing was inspired by all the Clint Eastwood Westerns I'd seen. <laughs> now, apparently he was once being interviewed by this reporter, and the reporter said to him, Mr. Eastwood, everybody thinks you're such a cool person, why is that? And he simply looked at the person who asked the question, produced a little cigarello from his pocket, put it on the edge of a table, flicked it so it started spinning in the air. While it was spinning in the air, he produced a match, lit it under the table, and in one very smooth action, caught the cigar, lit it, inhaled very deeply, blew one big smoke ring, three little smoke rings through the big smoke ring, and said, I don't know. <laughs> now, all of us have an image which we have appropriated to ourselves, which we are either trying to live out or project out to other people. Now, it may be a religious image and it may be an irreligious image, it doesn't matter, but everybody in this room, all of us, are living a life which we believe will both bring fulfillment and will also bring um, satisfaction to us. We're trying to become the people who we feel that we should be. Now, the danger or the challenge in living this way is it assumes both that we know where our decisions are actually going to take us and that we also know where we actually ultimately should be going. And this is actually exceedingly challenging because one of the things that humankind has struggled with enormously is trying to defend, defend, trying to define what is the goal and the end of man. Now, well-known writer by the man of G.K. Chesterton said that the trouble is, is that in a lot of modern literature, we make what he calls a medical mistake. And the medical mistake, he says, goes something like this. And you're going to hear this a lot because I think you have an election year in this, in this country, right? Is it this year you have an election? And I'd just like to say on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen that we invite you to rejoin the motherland <laughs> and end this rebellion that you started all those hundreds of years ago. We are a forgiving and generous nation. So, but Ch the way Chesterton phrased it was like this. He says... You listen to the politicians speak. He says, and they'll constantly draw medical analogies. And what they will say is, look, this country is sick. The nation is sick. And what we need is we need someone to come along and make us better. And the message always is, if you vote for us, if you put us in power, we can make the sickness and we can make you well. However, he says, this is an entirely flawed analogy. He says, for this reason, in the medical sciences... Every doctor agrees what a healthy patient looks like, but they disagree about the nature of the illness. So they, the do doctors may debate about what is actually causing you to be sick in the first place, but they're all united. They have a common vision of what a healthy body looks like. In the political and social sciences, however, it's the other way around, he says. In the political and social sciences, everybody seems happy to say, look, we're not well. The problem is, is that no one can agree on what a healthy country, what a healthy individual, what a fulfilled person actually looks like. In other words, he says, if you go to hospital, 
The hospital may send you back home by necessity with one leg less, but it will not, in a creative rapture, send you home with one leg extra. Okay? All doctors are agreed on what a healthy, whole body looks like, but they may disagree about what is actually making you ill in the first place. But in the social sciences, the trouble is not the fact that we can't agree that something is wrong. The trouble is, he says, that we can't agree what is actually right. And it is about defining the good and the ultimate goal of every human being that we eventually tear our eyes out politically. Could it be that the challenge that we have in the society in which we live is not the fact that we maybe cannot define evil, although I think that's increasingly becoming the case, but we're even, we are struggling and have continued to struggle to define what is good. Where should we ultimately be going? What does it actually mean to be human? Now, within the Christian worldview, of course, the biblical message is that a loving God has created a loving world, and he's put human beings in it which are capable of experiencing and expressing love and invites us into relationship with him. This is considered to be the chief end of man, that we may know him and enjoy him forever. Now, if that is the case, if that is what the goal is, then the question then is, is how then on earth do we understand what on earth is going on? Now, in this particular talk, I'm not going to be talking about the, whether the Christian faith is true or real. I'm going to come back to that in a couple of days' time. Nor am I going to be talking about some of the moral objections that there might be to what I'm about to say. I'm going to try and do that tomorrow. Okay, so I'm realizing the fact that I'm taking some jumps here. I hope that you'll bear with me. Am I speaking too slowly? Because I can't up the tempo <laughs> if it would help slightly. Now, if it is the case that a God who is in essence relational, in the sense that he exists in a set of living, loving relationships, and out of that has then proceeded to create life and invites us into fellowship with him and indeed created us to have fellowship with him, if that is the ultimate goal, that somehow we're to be in fellowship with him, then we have to have then some very important, we have some very important questions. One of which, increasingly, and I think... Indeed, this is going to be something that's going to be increasingly true for the next 10 years, and I've so far tried to restrain myself from writing a book mainly out of sympathy to anyone who might pick it up to read it. But this particular issue has so grabbed me, I, I feel that maybe I do need to sit down and write it. And I may be motivated to write if someone offered me an honorary doctorate. I just mentioned that in this college just in case <laughs> someone feels inspired. Is that we're struggling to define what the word a loving relationship may actually mean. I'm not even sure conceptually, especially within this current generation and the generations coming after it, whether it will be even possible to defend the notion that living relationships are real things. And this is where I'd like to come, because if our ultimate goal is somehow to have a relationship with God, and we're talking here about obstacles to actually having and walking a spiritual life, then this is going to become an all-defining issue. If it's not now, then certainly within the next five to ten years. Now, people do say things like, I love my car. Okay? You may hear boys, guys, saying this in particular. And guys, if you're single, that's because you say things like, I love my car. This is an inherently sad statement. Love, as classically understood and defined, is a relationship between two personal beings. Okay? You need two of them. Okay? You can look in the mirror, sigh, and say, I'm in love, but again, that is sad. <laughs> love is a quality that exists between personal beings. It cannot exist outside of that. And this is why the Christian doctrine of the Trinity is so foundational to an entire Christian worldview. Because if God is pure singularity, if God is one, if he is truly monotheistic, it means that God can neither experience nor express, God, express love until he's created someone else. This would mean that in order for God to have the fulfillment of experiencing and expressing love, it would make him dependent on creating another person who could reciprocate, because love cannot exist within a vacuum. So I don't know if you've ever been asked the question, like, what was God doing before he created the world? I think, I think it was Luther who was asked that question once publicly, and he responded by saying, making hell for people who ask difficult questions, or something like that. <laughs> but such a view means that God is dependent on his creation in order to enter into this state of experience, or to even know what this is. Now, the Christian faith is unique in all 
ancient religions and saying that God is love. Not just simply that God is loving, but that God is actually love. It's something that describes who he is, not just a function of what he does. And it's very hard to say that God is love in a way that is grammatically meaningful simply because you require two personal beings between whom love can be expressed and experienced. And this is exactly why the Trinity is so important. When my uh, first child was born, a girl called Lucy, um, because I like books, people gave her books. So she was given a mountain of books, and so I had the joy of reading all of these books to her. It's something that we still do, and it's something that we've, we've kept up to this day. She's now coming up for 13, and we still love reading to each other out loud all the time. She's currently reading a book called The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. It's a great book if you've never read it. And I'm thinking that next time we sit down, we're going to read a, read a book by Keith Ward on, on the nature of what it means to be a human being, who's a former professor of philosophy at Oxford, but I don't know how well that's going to go, but we'll see. <laughs> anyway, I can remember reading through these books, and one of these books, published by a Christian publisher, was entitled Someone to Love. And here's how it went. There was this God who created a beautiful blue and green planet, but he was all alone. And so he put people on this planet, and now eventually he had someone to love. Now, this book was not tossed aside lightly. It was thrown with great force, and it went straight into the bin. Because this describes exactly the issue that you may have, let's say, within Islam, and indeed that is an Islamic apologetic as to why God bothered to create us, but it doesn't work within the Christian faith. Because God exists in a set of living, loving relationships. He is a trinity. Three persons within one Godhead. He exists and relates to himself within that. He does not need to create us in order to experience or express love. He is love, and out of that, he then goes on to create us. So if a loving God who exists within relationship creates us and also wants us to be in fellowship with him, and this is ultimately to be the defining characteristic of true spiritual life, to know and walk with him, then understanding then both something about the nature of love and the nature of what it means to be a person is absolutely essential. Love is a quality that exists between personal beings. Now, when we say, I love my car, what we're talking about is something which is possessive, not relational. And if you're trying to have a relationship with your car, then you need the kind of psychiatric help that I can't give you, but may be freely available within the confines of this college. <laughs> now, what is more, all relationships are morally governed. We live in a morally governed universe and all forms of relationship are morally governed, the central relationship of which is a morally governed walk with God himself. Now, let me try to unpack the significance of this a little bit, and then I'm going to try and tie some of these different strands together, if I can, in my tired mind. Imagine a friend of yours. If you don't have any friends, then imagine that you have a friend. <laughs> what makes friendship possible? Well, one factor is the fact that you're able to trust them. That you feel that they are morally trustworthy. That you may confide in them, that you may share with them, that you may talk with them. You cannot trust someone who you believe is not worthy of trust, nor can you trust someone if you think that somehow they're not capable of holding it. What happens if they betray that trust? Well, the answer is, the friendship is broken. Relationships, all form of relationships, are morally governed. They are all a function of trust. And they grow and deepen over time in proportion to the trust that they have. This year, I'm going to be married for 18 years. Now, when I was engaged and just about to get married, I would sometimes hear people in church say things like, I love my wife more now than I did when I first married her. And I used to think to myself, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> Obviously, you married and you were in a very like lukewarm, matter-of-fact relationship, and then somehow over the years you've fallen in love. Because my reasoning went like this. The intensity of the feeling that I have for my wife, the intensity of the passion which I have, okay, and the enormous amount of discipline that is required to regulate that could not possibly be any stronger, any more intense, and any more overwhelmingly powerful than it is right now. And if you're not experiencing that, and you experienced that 18 years after you got married, there's something wrong with you. Well, now after 18 years of marriage, I know exactly what they're talking about. 
Because these kinds of relationships grow in intensity, in meaning, in depth over time. Because trust deepens. The relationship goes deeper. It becomes more satisfying, more intense, more fulfilling, more enjoyable. It grows directly in proportion to the trust which you're able to place in that person. And the more you get to know them, the more you get to know who they are, and the more you're able to enter into that, then the deeper the relationship and the more satisfying it is. Which is why these kinds of relationships are not just simply morally governed, but they're also qualified and they're also entered into through forms of moral commitment. Now, I know that we talk about the idea of trying to love people without making moral commitment, and we wonder why we should have to make moral commitment. But those words, I love you, are meaningful because of the moral framework within which they are spoken. Let me try to give you another example. Many years ago, when my wife and I were living up in the north of England, we inherited an all-female youth group. Now, I don't normally do youth meetings. That's not my, my forte, I'd say, teenagers, although every so often I speak to large groups of thousands of teenagers. They find me a curiosity. And so, and so we sat this, and it was this group. We First meeting, I sat down with them. There were 13 girls aged between 13 and 17, my wife and I. And I remember looking at this audience, feeling terrified by them. So I gave everybody a blank sheet of paper and a pen and said, I'd like you to write down on this piece of paper the things you'd most like to discuss in this group. At the end of the meeting, we counted them all up together, we gathered them all together, and there was only one issue that appeared on every single piece of paper, and the question was about love and marriage. Why bother getting married? What is love? Can you define it for me? Now, philosophers have wrestled with this question for thousands of years. This sent me into a panic. I prayed and fasted for a week. At the end of a week, we gathered together. We sat down in a large circle, and I asked them all to close their eyes. I said, I'd like you to imagine the following scenario with me. I'd like you to imagine that tomorrow you go to school, and the boy you like most comes up to you and says, I love you. How do you feel? Every face grinned from ear to ear, one of the largest smiles you could possibly imagine. Then I said, now I want you to imagine the next day you go back to school and you hear a, the same boy telling a different girl I love you. Now how do you feel? Every smile disappeared. So I invited them to open their eyes and simply said, you see, the words I love you are meaningful because they are given exclusively and committedly to you. Outside of that framework of moral exclusivity and commitment, those words mean nothing. That's why those great British philosophers um, a small group of them called the Spice Girls, who sort of <laughs> produced most of their work roughly 10 years ago, in one of their songs had a chorus that said, don't tell me you love me, just tell me you'll be there. Now, what's this about? It's about commitment. It's about saying, I'm sick and tired of hearing these words, I love you, I love you, I love you. They mean nothing outside of a framework of exclusivity and commitment. That's what makes those words meaningful. If we live in a universe where our primary goal is to have relationship with God which is morally governed and also to experience and express living and loving relationships. And if those living and loving relationships are governed by trust because all relationships are a function of trust, then it must also be the case that somehow we must also find a path both of commitment to make them meaningful and also the means by which huh, that we can come to those kinds of conclusions. Now here's the problem as I see it. A loving God did create a world in which all of this was possible, and he did invite us into that kind of fellowship with him. And he endowed it with a moral framework that makes love both possible, meaningful, actual, real. But we have decided we can live without him, and we have tried to reject him and to break his law. Now, in one sense, it is impossible to break God's moral law. Let me just read to you um, a little bit from a book uh, called Isaiah. I'm sure you've come across it before. Uh, let me just read to you from verse 4, just a few verses. This is what it says. Sinful nation, a people laden with, laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. You have forsaken the Lord and despised the Holy One of Israel. You are utterly estranged. Why will you be struck down? Why do you continue to rebel? 
The whole head is sick, the whole heart faint. From the sole of your foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds, and they're not pressed or bound up or softened with oil. Now, what did you just hear? Did you just hear someone angry speaking at you? Have you ever noticed that sometimes parents ask their children stupid questions? Have you ever noticed that? Like, do you want me to smack you? you know, I mean, that's a crazy question. Now, here it may look at first glance that God is asking a crazy question, but this is not a crazy question at all. In one sense, it's impossible to break God's moral law. It's impossible to break, break God's moral law in the following way. Let's suppose you want to break the law of gravity. So you climb to the top of this very fine chapel you have on your campus, to the top of the spire. Now, you put a red cape around your neck, and a pair of red underpants on the outside of what you're wearing, <laughs> and you put a big S on your chest, and you throw yourself from the tower, from the spire, in an attempt to break the law of gravity. What will you break? <laughs> you will break yourself while proving the law in the very process. In that sense, it is impossible to break God's moral law. Whenever you try to break God's moral law, you simply end up breaking yourself while proving his law in the first place. By trying to go against God and rejecting him, we have broken lives and we live in a broken world. Has anyone ever stabbed you in the back? Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? Did it hurt? Every time we break God's law, every time we sin, someone gets hurt. Now, this is more serious than I've actually put it so far. And it's more serious in two ways. I'm going to delay one of them for a moment, but let me just focus at the moment at the human level. We live in a very interesting time right now, 2012. We live in, once again, a highly sexualized culture. It's happened in the past through Greece and Rome and various other great civilizations, and it's happening right now. In the 1970s and 80s, which is, I'm guessing, before any of you in this room were born, more or less, which makes me feel even older, and slightly more depressed than I did when I first got up here. <laughs> there was a movement called feminism. Now, there are many parts to this movement, but one part, one central cry of feminism, went like this. We are human beings. We are not objects to be bought and sold. We are human beings. Treat us like human beings, which is why you would find in America, the head of the feminist movement at the time, one of the, the intellectual leader of it, and Billy Graham on the street together, burning pornography together. It was an understanding of the fact that it is wrong to treat people as objects, but rather we need to recognize the fact that they are persons, that they are people. Now, there are many other movements that actually preceded this, and you can see how one led to the other. I was in Memphis a couple of weeks ago, and I went to the Civil Rights Museum. I went there with my father, who broke down into tears as we walked around. One of the pictures that spoke to me very, very powerfully was a scene of rubbish collectors who'd gone out on strike, all of them black Americans, by definition at that point, they were entirely populated by black workers. And they didn't collect the rubbish for weeks, and it piled up. And then one day they went on a march through Memphis, and they all had around them giant cardboard cutouts that were just a square piece of card with the words written on them, I am a man. Not an object. I'm not here to be bought and sold. I am a human being. I'm asking to be treated as a human being. One of the effects of sin 
is it makes us treat people like objects. Now, the fact that we have therefore made sin normal, and certainly sexual sin normal in our culture, means that during the sexual revolutions of the 60s and 70s, where sex was seen as a mystical connection within the hippie culture, has now actually become, become simple, simply sexual consumption. It is why we live in a culture where women will gladly wear t-shirts that say, I am a porn star on it. In other words, not only am I happy to be treated as an object, but if I can use this in a way to further my career or earn money, then that's fine by me. So the irony is, and the most insightful writers on this, by the way, I think who are writing right now are what are called the neo-feminists, who are all young Americans in their 30s, who are writing about this, I think, with more insight, and certainly have, seem to have more insight, sadly, than even the church does on this issue at the moment. What they are now saying is this is crazy. We had this huge movement saying, treat us like human beings. We want to be thought of as human beings, not as objects. But instead of culture coming up to here, the whole culture has sunk down to here. Not only are we being treated as objects, we now think it's emancipated to be treated as an object. That somehow we are sexually liberated, we're sexually free if people relate to us as objects and consume us as objects. That's okay, so long as there's enough money in it. What has gone wrong, they say? The presence of sin destroys relationship. You cannot have intimate relationship in the sense, in a relational way, but you can have relationship in consumption, which is why now so much of our sexual ethics are driven, not to say, not by the idea of connection, but by consumption. We're happy to consume each other, which is why pornography is not seen, even by many Christians, as a serious issue in their own lives. As you look at people, and as you relate to them, do you think of them as human beings, as people, or are you increasingly thinking of yourself as an object and relating to other people as an object? Are you looking for connection with other people or consumption? We're living in some very challenging times. Now this kind of sin not only does it make us treat other people as objects, it also makes us to begin to think of ourselves as objects. As a matter of fact, it makes us increasingly incapable of entering into meaningful relationship. It actually has the effect of destroying us. And eventually, we begin thinking of God as an object. I don't have time to talk to you about why the Old and New Testament talk so much about idolatry, but a lot of what idolatry is is taking God as a living human, sorry, living human, as a living spiritual being and reducing him into a physical object of wood that neither thinks, feels, nor acts, nor has any capacity to do so. As you enter this week, may I ask not just simply about how you relate to yourself, to other people, but how do you think of God? Is he a living, personal being with whom you enjoy relationship? Or has he become even though you may come to chapel regularly and maybe even attend church on a Sunday, become an object to be consumed. How are you connecting with him? Because I can promise you something. If God has become an object, he becomes increasingly, increasingly meaningless. He becomes someone to be consumed. You go to church, you come to a chapel service, you feel bad about yourself because there's maybe something you're doing that you shouldn't be doing or something you're struggling with that you know you shouldn't be struggling with. So you come along and you attend the experience. It comes to a point where you can say sorry, and you come up to God as a spiritual ATM, you punch in your number, and out comes a little piece of paper, you're forgiven, and we suddenly feel better about ourselves, and we consume it, like we would chew gum, and we go away, we feel better about ourselves for a while until we do exactly the same thing again. Then we come back to God, to the forgiveness machine. We tap in our number to the spiritual ATM, out comes another piece of paper, you're forgiven, and we feel good about ourselves again. We can put it in, we chew it, and we consume it, we feel good about ourselves until we do the same thing again. And then we come back to him again, and we punch in the number again, and once more we get the forgiveness shit. And we pop it in, and we chew it, and we feel good about ourselves, and we keep repeating the process until it becomes meaningless. Are you in relationship with God? Are you connected to him? Or is it possible that you've moved into consumption, 
And if you've moved into consumption, you're not very far away from rejecting them altogether. Sin destroys everything. It destroys us, it destroys our relationships with others, and it destroys our relationship with God because all relationships are morally governed. And when we break that, we break ourselves and we live in a broken world and the evidence is around us everywhere. Now we also read that this breaks God's heart. Jesus Christ comes into this world in Luke 19 and we read and he weeps. He looks out over a city and he says, I have longed to gather you at one point. Under my wings as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing, he says. Now the picture is amazing. God himself comes into the world. God himself looks at a religious city. I want to emphasize that again. He looks at a religious city filled with temples and religious people who are going through actions, going to the temple, not just once a week, but for many every day or maybe twice a day. And he says, I want to have connection and relationship with you. I have longed to gather you to me, but you are not willing. So whatever the solution is to this, the solution is not religion. I don't have time to do all of this now, but if we did, I'd read you the rest of Isaiah 1, where God continues to ask a whole series of questions. Having asked, why do you continue in a rebellion? Why do you want to be struck down again? What God is saying, look, every time you break my law, you break yourself, you break everything around you. Everything's being destroyed. Why would you do that? It's crazy. Then he says, look at your cities, they're being destroyed. Look at your fields, they're being destroyed. And he goes on and on and on. And then he asks some very interesting questions. He says, when you come before me, who has required this of you, this trampling of my courts? What is it to me, this multitude of sacrifices? Who asked you to bring them? These are great questions. Do you know why? Who asked them to come into the temple? Who asked them to bring the sacrifices? The answer is, now you see, if you're good Pentecostals at this point, you'd be yelling back at me and waving your hands. The answer is God. I'm going to give you a clue. Most of the answers to most of the questions they're going to be asking you all week, go for God, you're going to be right at least 80% of the time. <laughs> God asked them to come to the temple. God asked them to make the sacrifices. He's the one who provided the whole thing. And here he is in Isaiah 1 saying, when you come before me, who has required this of you, this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. They are abomination to me. I cannot endure them. Okay? Now, isn't that interesting? They have become burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. This is amazing stuff in Isaiah 1. Have you ever been to church and been bored? I know some of you are experiencing that right now, but I mean, just even more generally. God is weary and tired of going and attending these services. Because the purpose isn't to go through some ritual, some process of consumption to make them feel good about themselves. The purpose of the sacrifice, the purpose of the temple is to open up a way by where they may have a relationship with him. A loving God created a loving world. He endowed it with a framework that makes love possible of experience and expression and invites us into fellowship with him. But we have rejected him, broken his law. We have broken lives. We live in a broken world. This has broken God's heart. And the amazing thing about the gospel is that when Jesus Christ came into this world, the night before he was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. The reason why the gospel is good news as opposed to bad news, because what we've been talking about so far isn't particularly necessarily good news, is that God actually, through all of this, our rejection of him, our treating him as an object, our treating of other people as objects, even thinking of ourselves like that, is that he wants us to enter into a relationship with him. You get it? Halfway through Isaiah chapter 1. Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins are about like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Jesus Christ comes into this world. And on the cross, he is broken for us. His bed is shed for us. He takes all of the consequences of sin and all of the punishment that sin and rebelling against God deserves and he takes it on to himself he pays the price for what 
we have done wrong. Now the trouble is, most of you already know that. Most of you have already heard that. Most of you already have prayed. God, will you forgive me? But here's the question. When we look at what God has done, the provision that he has made to come after us, and we say sorry, why are we saying sorry? Why? Is it to make ourselves feel better about ourselves? Well, it can be. Has anyone ever hurt you, done something really bad, and they come to you and they say, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings? How many people have heard that apology? Keep your hand in the air if you are happy with it. Right, every hand has gone down. Why? Because it's not an apology. Right? It's saying, look, I can see you're very upset, and I can see you're very hurt, and I can see that you think I did something that made you hurt and upset, and I'm sorry that I've hurt your feelings, which is a bit like saying, if you weren't so sensitive and emotional about these things, you'd be fine. Guys, I hope you're listening again. <laughs> this is the average male apology, or women do it too. It is not an admission of wrongdoing. It's not an admission of guilt. And actually, the reason for the apology is to get the other person to calm down so they won't be upset, so upset about it, so they won't feel so hurt, so you can just move on and get on with the rest of your life. That is not what the biblical concept of forgiveness is at all. It is a consumption theory of forgiveness that will make you feel better about yourself and you're hoping somehow through some mystical process will make them feel better about themselves, but it simply won't work. I, I love what a guy called John Piper wrote about this subject. I don't know, have any of you read any John Piper? Some of you have. If you know your theology, you'll realize he's a very strong Calvinist, much stronger than I am, but I don't blame him for that. He had no choice in the issue. God made him that way. <laughs> now, he... But here's how he phrases it, and I, I think he puts it very well. He says, look, let's supposing you have an argument with your wife. Now, we're brought out here, boyfriend, girlfriend, good friend. Now, I'm married. In my context, the way this normally plays out is like this, is that in my bedroom, we have a, a basket that you're meant to put dirty laundry in. Okay? And the idea is, is that at the end of every day, you put your dirty laundry in the basket. Now, I didn't grow up with a laundry basket, and I'm not used to having one. But I did used to captain my basketball team at school. So I see this as something to be aimed at. And sometimes everything goes in. Sometimes it's a rebound, and sometimes it gets caught on the light fitting. But it goes in the general direction of the basket. Sometimes it goes in, and sometimes it goes out. Now, let's suppose my you know, wife comes back into the bedroom, and she sees the mess, and she just says, why can't you just put your dirty laundry in the laundry basket like everybody else in this family? And because I am grumpy, and because I'm selfish, I tell her exactly what she can do with the laundry basket. <laughs> she turns on her heel, and she walks out of the room. I follow her into the kitchen. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife. Now, what needs to happen here? Well, the answer is clear, clear right? She needs to apologize. No, 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 sorry. I, I need to apologize. Why? Why do I want to say sorry? So that she'll make my favorite breakfast, Piper says. So I won't feel guilty at work. Why do I want to apologize? And the answer is, I want the sweet fellowship of my wife back. She is the reason I want to be forgiven. I want forgiveness so I can be back in the relationship with her that I had before I said something that was so stupidly wrong. She is the reason I want to be forgiven. The cross, Christ's incarnation, his death, his resurrection, 
His offer to us of new life. All of these are things which are done to make it possible for us to come into relationship with him. If you have come to Christ for any other reason than wanting connection with him, fellowship with him, relationship with him, I can more or less guarantee that you're not in relationship with him. You maybe end up in an endless cycle of, of repentance. You may even feel bad from time to time about certain things, but you're not walking with him. God hasn't come into this world to make you feel better about you. He's come into this world so that we may be in relationship with him. Now, there are some consequences to that, one of which is I think you do feel better about yourself, but is he the reason you want to be forgiven? Why is the trampling of the court meaningless? Why is the offering of the sacrifice meaningless? The answer is simple. They're going through the motions. They're going through the actions. They might even say, I'm sorry. They may not even say, I'm sorry. I hurt your feelings, God. They may just say, God, I am sorry. But why? Well, I'm coming up to the end of my time here. I don't know if you've seen the film Inception. It's a brilliant film. The hero of that film, well not hero, the main character of that film, Don Cobb, is a broken man. He lives in and has access to multiple layers of reality. But what he wants most is to right a wrong that was done a long time ago. A colleague of mine by the name of Tom Price who analyzes films for a living, even gets paid for it by Sony Corporation and various others from time to time, which just doesn't seem fair to me. <laughs> he put it like this. He says, only when Don Cobb admits his guilt and takes responsibility for who he is, can he even begin to come back to reality, sanity, and home. When you sin against someone, you can't look them in the eye. You may desperately want to have a relationship with them, but you just simply can't look them in the eye. Because that moral breach breaks the relationship. And when you sin against God, you simply can't look him in the eye. Here's the amazing thing. God is actually looking at us. He is offering to forgive us even before we ask for it. He offers forgiveness as a gift. And if you receive it, you can have a relationship with him. I, maybe this analogy may help. I, uh, I don't know if you've ever insulted someone accidentally. Uh, I seem to be very good at doing that. If you insult a friend accidentally, and you go up to them after you've said something really stupid, you may say to them, look, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. Now, sometimes everything's fine. Sometimes they say, it's nothing, forget about it. You ever had that experience? Now, here's the interesting thing. The next day, when you walk into a room with them, within one nanosecond, you know if they've forgiven you or not, don't they? Don't you? You don't have to say anything. No words need to pass across the room you know if they have genuinely forgiven you. And if they haven't, we normally go up a second time and say, look, I'm really sorry, please forgive me. And if they say, it's nothing, forget about it, and walk off, it gets really annoying, doesn't it? Right, in the sense that you know that you're wrong, you want to say sorry. But the very fact that they're not prepared to even admit, that makes sense that they've been offended or you have done something wrong, is actually getting in the way of the apology. Does that make sense? So for forgiveness to work, for relationships to be restored, you actually need someone who's willing to forgive, but you need more than that. Because the offer of forgiveness is, can only be received by true repentance. So here's the other half of that illustration. Let's supposing that in my sermon tonight, I publicly insult from this platform the president of this college, okay, Michael. And I say to you that in my opinion, the president of this college has the intellectual capacity more commonly associated with forms of pond life invisible to the naked eye. And let's assume through some utterly mystifying process he takes that to be insulting. 
after I finish, and the uh, are you the pastor, rector, chaplain, okay, pope comes up <laughs> and pronounces his blessing, you will file out of here saying, what has Michael Ramsden got against Michael Lindsay? This is really interesting. And you all fall out there, and, and as you walk out, you see him sat to his pew, stunned. The next morning, you see me on campus. I'm here having a coffee, and you, you come up, and you sit next to me, and you say, uh, Michael, that was an interesting meeting last night. Everyone's still talking about it. How, how, how are things between you and Michael Lindsay? And I say to you, you know what? He's one of the closest friends I have. As a matter of fact, I don't think I'm closer to anyone in the world right now than to him. Now, how does that sound to you? I would have to have the emotional intelligence of a carrot <laughs> to come to that conclusion, right? But there's only one set of circumstances under which what I say to you may be completely true. Let's suppose enough to everyone is left. Michael comes up to me, Dr. Michael Lindsay, and he says, he sits me down, and he starts talking to me, and he makes it very clear to me that although he has no idea why I did what I did or why I said what I said, that he is willing to forgive me. And as I talk to him, I suddenly realize how wrong I was, and I say to him, Michael, I'm really sorry. I was completely wrong what I said. I don't know why I made up those things. I barely know you and I, I can't believe what I did from the platform. And we stay up until two, three, four in the morning. We talk, he prays for me. Maybe even tears are shed. I'm a new man, I'm not scared of crying. <laughs> and then that morning, when, later that morning when you come and say, how's everything between you and him? And I say, it's the most meaningful relationship I have. I don't think I'm closer to anyone else than right in the world right now than him. I would be speaking the complete, total, and utter truth. There's nothing presumptuous about it, there's nothing arrogant about it, and there's nothing uninformed about it. The message of the gospel is not come and beg God for forgiveness and you'll feel better. It's not come and beg God forgiveness and eventually he'll forgive you. It is that before we even wanted to be forgiven, Christ was broken for us. He makes forgiveness possible. He offers us forgiveness as a gift. And if we repent before him, we can enter into that relationship with him. And if the reason is because we are prepared to follow him, put our faith in him, our trust in him, and follow him the rest of our days of our life and walk with him, the reason is connection rather than consumption. It'll be utterly life transforming. Can I pray for you? Father, I thank you for this evening and thank you that even though I am tired, we were able to finish this message before midnight. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity this week to bring ourselves again before you and maybe ask ourselves some difficult questions. Father, I want to pray for those in this room, Lord, who have got caught up in patterns of behavior that are destroying them. Father, I pray, Lord, that they may know the hope that you alone bring, the promise of new life, of a new start, Father, the promise for, of, of healing where we have so broken and destroyed ourselves. Father, I pray they may know that and I pray, Father, you may give them the honesty that they need to open up to those around them to share where things are going wrong. Father, I pray for those, Lord, here who have fallen into a relationship of consumption with you. Father, we bring our, our hearts before you and pray, Lord, that we may not pursue you and use you for our own ends, but that we may truly know relationship with you and that we may enter into that relationship. We thank you for the forgiveness that you have secured and the price you have paid to make it possible. And Father, we both want to receive that forgiveness and walk with you for the rest of our days, wherever it may lead and whatever it may cost us. Father, I pray for those who are here who 
are wrestling with honest, heartfelt questions that seem almost insurmountable, be they intellectual struggles or, or moral, moral struggles with you or with your church. And pray, Father, that this week may be a week of, of clarity and honesty and truth. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can be in a place like this. And we thank you, Father, for the way that you have lavished grace upon us. And Father, we thank you for the words of the song that we sung today, that in your kingdom, broken lives are made new. And we pray, Father, we may know that newness of life as we receive what you have done for us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.